All right, so here we are, ready for the menopausal hormone therapy masterclass, which will be facilitated tonight by myself, I'm Marnie Luck, and by Dr. Diana Kasselman as well. So without further ado, we'll get started and a little bit of an overview of what we'll be talking about today. First off, um, menopause 101, really defining what that menopausal transition is and under, understanding how it changes our health. Um, then we'll talk about hormone therapy and really get to the bottom of the differences between different types of prescriptions and terminology, as well as the history and controversy around hormone therapy. We'll talk about the benefits of menopausal hormone therapy and really understand what the data says regarding the positive outcomes of MHT, so menopausal hormone therapy. We'll also talk about the risks associated with menopausal hormone therapy and really understand what factors increase those risks. And then we'll finish off by talking about how naturopathic doctors are really well positioned to support um, people going through menopause and all of the comprehensive support that we're able to provide. So a little bit about your presenters tonight. Um, as I said, I'm Marnie. I'm, I know many of you, so it's good to see you here. Um, I've been in practice for almost like seven or eight years now. And a big part of my practice is supporting people through perimenopause all the way through postmenopause and then before and after those transitions as well. Um, and part of the reason that I am so passionate about menopause is my mom. Um, I was just, you know, entering my naturopathic medical degree as she was entering her menopausal transition. And I remember watching her go through that and the supports that were available to her and that weren't. And as soon as I you know, got into practice and really started learning more about um, menopause and the options, including hormone therapy, I realized what, what an important aspect that could play in, in people's health. And I definitely thought about my mom and definitely got her set up with a practitioner who could support her. And I can say that over the last four or five years, I've really had to learn, unlearn, relearn, and really try to get to the bottom of what the, the evidence says and where we stand now with regards to menopausal hormone therapy so that I can really effectively um, treat women going through menopause. Um, and I would say that my knowledge is, you know, always deepening and um, I try to stay up to date as possible. So this presentation that Diane and I are going to do are going to be, it's going to be quite a, a synthesis of, of that knowledge that, that we've gained over time. So I'll let Diana introduce herself now. Thanks, Marnie. So yeah, I'm Dr. Diana Kesselman. Um, Marnie and I connected when I was uh, in school and I was fortunate enough to do my externship with Marnie. Um, and we definitely have a very similar way of practicing. My story is very similar to Marnie's as to why I I'm really passionate about this area. Um, when I was finishing uh, naturopathic medicine was when sort of my mom was entering this phase of life. And I was, I just wanted her to have both all the options to, for herself and to know what both non-hormonal and hormonal options are because that wasn't given to her. That wasn't an informed consent conversation that was being had with her medical provider. Um, and that's where I wanted her to get that support. We have really um, interesting data that's come out in the past couple of years that has looked at medical school graduates. Um, so also like residents and um, uh, internal residents and obstetrics and gynecology, and they received little to no training in supporting menopause women. And this was like a big aha moment where um, the study said that 30 to 50% of residents in both specialties in their final year of training responded in a survey that they were not at all prepared to manage menopausal women. And I think that's really where, again, where we step in and women shouldn't just be left to kind of deal with this phase of life and dread it and have to go through all the symptoms without the support. And that's what we're here to do today is, is provide that support and give you the education. 
Well, we'll, we'll and this is this is a great segue into our, our next section, which is really like menopause 101 and taking a look at the numbers. So menopause in Canada, the life expectancy for for Canadian women is 84. So I believe it says 84. Right? Yes. Um, and so what 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 that means is most Canadian women will spend up to 40 percent of their lives in postmenopause. So in 40% of their lives is spent in without periods and you know, without that ovarian function and hormone production. And that's a, that's a significant portion. Um, I always like to, to make light of it and say, you know, we, we live a really long time. We, we, we outlive our ovaries, if you will. And if we look at, at the amount of, of of women entering menopause, that number is going to continue to increase um, to about uh, 43%. So in 2016, about 39% of Canadian women were at least age 50 years of 50 years of age. The median age for, for menopause is 52. And so this number is projected to increase by 43%. So that's a lot of people by the year 2038 who will likely be in menopause. And that's in just in Canada. When we look at it uh, globally, so by the year 2025, and if you can believe it or not, that's that's three years away, the number of postmenopausal women is expected to rise to 1.1 billion. I said this stat um, recently to someone, and they said, "Whoa, that's a lot of hot flashes. You could you could you could power the whole world with all of that energy." And it's like, yes. Yeah, so, we can phrase it in a sense like it's a very powerful amount of people, 1.1 billion people. Um, so that's this is where it's it's that much more important that we start to to support this phase of life um, in an informed and evidence based way that really really supports people's health. So let's really define what menopause is. And there's different ways that we can define menopause. Is, you know, is it an endocrine disorder and it should be treated medically with the same seriousness that we treat other endocrine disorders such as diabetes or thyroid disorders? So that's a very like medicalized way of looking at it. Um, is it a natural progression of aging whereby a woman's reproductive capabilities cease? Is it an empowering rite of passage, you know, a major time of transformation and maturation? So, there, and you know, perhaps it's all of these things. And if we look at really understanding the terminology that we use and using the terminology appropriately, we can understand, you know, to differentiate what the difference is between the phases that we go through when we're transitioning into postmenopause. So the menopause transition is the time before the final menstrual period when the cycle becomes variable. And we have the early menopause transition, which is where we have seven or more days persistent difference in cycle lengths from one cycle to the next. So that would look like you have your, your, your typical cycles previously were every 28 days, like you were like clockwork. And this is considering and when we talk about, about these types of cycles that we're assuming that they're, you're not on a hormonal contraceptive pill that is um, where you're not having true ovulatory cycles. We're talking about ovulatory cycles without um, hormonal contraception when we're talking about menstrual cycles in, in menopausal transitions. So early menopause transition is when there's seven or more days persistent difference in cycle length. So maybe you had a 28 day cycle, then you had a 20 day cycle, and then you have a 40 day cycle, and then you have a 23 day cycle. Um, this is a very common uh, phase people will enter in their, their mid to late 40s, sometimes earlier, sometimes later. The late menopause transition is where we start to see fully skipped cycles. So we get 60 or more days of amenorrhea. Menopause itself is the cessation of menses. And we can only discern that you truly are in menopause retrospectively. So we have to count back 12 months of not giving a period to define, yes, you are now in postmenopause. Perimenopause is the time, the early menopause transition through the year after the final menstrual period. 
So if you can see how I've laid it out here, it encompasses the early menopause transition, the late menopause transition, and that year after the final menstrual period before you enter postmenopause. So that's, that's the terminology in a nutshell. So if you're thinking about perhaps if you're watching this presentation, you can gauge where you are in this transition. And if you aren't in the early menopause transition, you're or late menopause transition or in postmenopause, you're likely in, in your, what we call your reproductive years still. This is a really cool uh, chart that I've had to look at many, many times to fully wrap my head around because it's, it's very complex, but it works. And it's really cool to be able to, to understand where someone is in terms of their reproductive aging. So for example, let's say somebody is 50 years old and they've started to miss periods. So they've gone more than 60 days without a period and we do blood work and we see that their FSH is around 40, which makes sense because their brain is trying to yell at their ovaries to produce estrogen. They, and they don't have um, very many follicles. So their antral follicle um, count is low and they're having some hot flashes, some basal notices symptoms. So if we look on this chart, it looks like they are in the late um, menopause transition. Whereas another person, let's say they're, let's say they're 40, 40 years old and they're getting regular cycles, but they're starting to notice subtle changes. Like their periods are a little bit heavy, heavier than they used to be. And, you know, instead of 28 days, they're 26 sometimes. And so that would be stage negative three A. So the part of the late reproductive years. So there's, there's still that fertility aspect there, but things are starting to change. They're not, and they haven't entered perimenopause yet, but things are starting to change. So this is a really cool um, chart that you can look up. It's called um, the straw criteria. Um, and it's, it's a way that we can really pinpoint where somebody is on in terms of their reproductive years and or their menopause transition. So some, some health changes that people notice in perimenopause and menopause. Uh, so perimenopause, definitely there's irregular menstrual cycles. There's a worsening in PMS, so premenstrual um, syndromes or symptoms. Um, there's a lot of sleep disturbances. So whether that be difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep, hot flashes um, or night sweats. We can see mood changes. So a lot of people will say, you know, out of the blue, I just started to feel more anxious and nothing really and also my life has changed. Um, but I've noticed my hormones, things just feel different and my periods are, are all over the map. So we see mood changes. There can be some weight gain. Um, there can be some hair loss uh, or growth. Some people will tell me, Marnie, like all of a sudden I'm getting these weird chin hairs. I've never had them before. So that can also be some part of that hormonal fluctuation, fluctuation that we get. Um, and also I like to disclosure here, chin, chin hairs are not weird, they are normal and you can get them in any stage of your life. Um, hot flashes, night sweats like we talked about, uh, joint pain, a lot of vaginal dryness or vaginal concerns, pain with intercourse, um, especially if there is that vaginal dryness, some cardiometabolic changes. So this is a stage in people's lives where they may um, start to have higher cholesterol or insulin resistance or diabetes. And then um, bone changes can often happen too. So osteopenia, so low bone density um, or osteoporosis. Okay. And so what we see here, if we look back at our, our peak reproductive years, we have this, these lovely like balanced cyclical fluctuations. We can, we can really predict what's gonna happen and when we see these, this lovely estrogen level, you know, it's low when we have our period, it slowly rises. There's a little dip after we ovulate, then it kind of stabilizes throughout our luteal phase and then it drops again. And then with progesterone, we see that it rises after we ovulate and then slowly drops and then we get our period. So it's very predictable, predictable having regular cycles. Um, and this isn't somebody who doesn't have any type of um, ovulatory dysfunction happening. Obviously, some people might have um, oligomenorrhea and not be perimenopausal. So we see that in PCOS. We see that in functional hypothalamic amenorrhea. So there are stages where you, we cannot put you in on, on that straw criteria because 
there is a, an ovulatory dysfunction innately, but if you don't have that, you're having very balanced cyclical fluctuations of hormones in your pre reproductive years. And what happens when we start to enter perimenopause is um, what, what, is, what we can term as compensated failure. I think this is such a funny term, but it's essentially compensated fa failure of the hypothalamic pituitary axis. So the hypothalamic, the hypothalamus and the pituitary are, are areas in our brain that modulate hormones. So what happens is the brain secretes a hormone called follicle stimulating hormone that tells the ovaries, hey, let's try and let's try and get these follicles recruited so that we can ovulate an egg, right? Let's really try to get this going. And then the, the ovaries start to say, uh, I can't really do that right now. And the brain starts to yell at the ovaries and increase its level of FS, FSH, the follicle stimulating hormone. And then the ovaries start to really try and get to the point where they're going to ovulate, but it's harder and harder for that to happen. And so what we start to see because the ovaries are struggling to, to ovulate is we start to see that cycle variation. We start to see shortened follicular phase or shortened cycles. Um, or just overt ovulatory failures. So you'll see the body try and ovulate, it can't, and then it gets a, a bleed at some point, but it's not a true ovulatory bleed um, or a bleed that comes after ovulation. So what we start to see because of this uh, compensated failure are more variable levels of estrogen and progesterone, which then leads to worsening in PMS symptoms. So I, I put it lightly with my patients, but I'll say, does it feel like you have PMS times 10? And they're like, yes. And that's because PMS often, the way that we're experiencing it, it we experience it is, is the, our body's response to that fluctuation in hormone levels. And the more of a fluctuation it has that it's not used to, used to the harder it is to keep up. And then our mood changes, our, our, we might get more breast tenderness, we might have more cramping, we might have more fatigue, more sleep disturbances. And it's because of these more variable levels of our estrogen and progesterone. Another wacky thing that starts to happen, especially as we enter that late menopausal transition. So when our periods start to become more delayed and we skip cycles are something called loop cycles or luteal out of phase events. And I like to, to say our periods get a little loopy. And so what can actually happen here, because that follicle stimulating hormone is so high and it's really starting to, 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 rate, to rise and, and yell at the ovaries, after you've ovulated, your ovaries may try to recruit another set of follicles. And it's our follicles in our ovaries that, that, are, that relate to our estrogen production. And so what can happen is you can have estrogen levels superimposed on top of your estrogen levels that you had just created from that cycle. So you get, um, you know, a relative ex estrogen excess. And this is where what will happen is people will start to have these really, really um, heavy bleeding events or, or what we call flooding because you have this un unopposed estrogen and lack of ovulation and these funky long cycles. And then you get this big bleed. So we term this as a loop cycle. And we can actually, you know, measure this with, with on ultrasound to see what's happened. We, we don't typically do this in practice because it would be quite uh, labor intensive, but these are, these are the loop cycles are why periods get so wonky before you actually enter into menopause because you're getting very sporadic ovulations or not getting ovulations at all. I'm going to pass it over to Diana to talk about hormone therapy. Okay, so we'll start uh, with some terminology. Um, so what is HRT, HT, MHT? Some of them are used interchangeably now. Um, so HRT used to be the term that was used all the time. Um, it's actually no longer used. It's been replaced with menopausal hormone therapy or MHT, which is what we titled this, uh, this talk. Um, and the reason HRT is no longer used is because the... Um, term replacement isn't actually what's been going on. So menopause is not um, a deficiency state where replacement is actually required. The use of hormone therapy is therapeutic for menopausal symptoms, and it's not a replacement for a deficiency state. And that's why that's no longer used. Um, hormone therapy can be used interchangeably with MHT. Um, the 
sort of con with hormone therapy is that it's not really specific. So we can use hormone therapy in instances to mean like your own thyroid hormonal or insulin, um, that kind of thing. So it's not specific to that menopause um, transition. So now menopausal hormone therapy is being adopted worldwide um, as the terminology. Next slide. Okay, perfect. So what we wanted to break down, I know the slides a lot, but stay with us. We're, we're going to break it down for you. And what we wanted to do here is um, there's a lot of terminology, a lot of uh, there's, as you know, different types of estrogens, different types of progesterone, like we just want to break down the terminology so that when you guys come across this, you know what we're talking about. Um, so estrogens, this is the class of all natural or synthetic hormones uh, that bind to and activate estrogen receptors. So it's the umbrella term. Okay. Then we have kind of subheadings to that. Um, and the synthetic one of the synthetic versions of estrogens is called conjugated equine estrogens. This is the estrogen that is derived from the urine of pregnant mares. And it's the estrogen that we'll talk about uh, in a little bit, but it was the estrogen that was used in the Women's Health Initiative study, study that was published in 2002, which we'll, we'll talk about because I'm sure you guys have heard of it. But this specific synthetic estrogen is a mixture of at least 10 active estrogens and it's taken orally. Okay. And there's another type of synthetic estrogen called ethanol, um, ethanol estradiol. And this synthetic form is used primarily in birth control pills in combinations with a progestin, which is a type of synthetic progesterone. So, um, so that's the differenti differentiation between the two there. And then 17 beta estradiol, this is the most active estrogen in all of our bodies. We, we naturally make this estrogen. Um, and so therefore it's considered a bioequivalent form of estrogen. Um, and this is typically what we use in practice. So you can administer it orally, vaginally, transdermally. So there's many different ways you can do it. And we'll talk about the ways that, that we prescribe that as well. But so when you hear like the term bioidentical uh, hormone, they're typically using 17 beta estradiol in that specific formulation. And then progestogens, again, this is the umbrella term for a class of natural or synthetic steroid hormones that bind to and activate the progesterone receptors in our body. Then the two um, types of progestin, so you can, progestogen, sorry, you can have progestin, which is the synthetic form. This is used in birth control pills, IUD, that kind of thing. Um, and then progesterone, that's again, the bioequivalent form of progesterone. And this is typically administered uh, through what's called micronized progesterone. We take this orally. Um, and so that's the bioequivalent form. And then we wanted to differentiate between bioidentical and compounded hormones um, because that can get confusing a bit as well. So bioidentical hormones are hormones that are chemically identical to those that are made by human tissue. Um, and this actually includes commercially available products. So for example, you can get um, 17 beta estradiol products uh, out there that are commercially made, you know, FDA approved, but that's still considered bioidentical. So do you see kind of the difference there. And then compounded hormones are hormones that have been custom made into a pill, spray, cream, or suppository formed by a compounding pharmacy. Um, and compounding hormones can be really beneficial, for example, in cases where there's actually no commercially available products um, that meets the needs of our patient. So a common one that we use in practice is estriol vaginal cream. So estriol is a type of estrogen. Uh, we do produce it um, as women. It is, it's highest in, our, in pregnancy. So if we get pregnant, it's highest during that point. Otherwise, it's typically low levels, but we use estriol vaginal cream um, for GSM. GSM is called um, genital urinary syndrome of menopause. That's where women can get, um, it, it's an umbrella term to mean that women are predisposed to like UTIs, vaginal irritation, um, vaginal dryness, that kind of thing. So that's what we use estrel vaginal cream for, um, which can be very, very beneficial for women. So again, compounded hormone therapy um, 
is great to use when we need to titrate doses. Maybe if commercially available products are very set doses, right? So if we maybe want to get a dose that's like in between two doses, we can compound those hormones. And again, we can use it if there's no commercially uh, products available that meets the needs of our patients. Um, and whenever we work with pharmacies, both Marnie and I, we always make sure that you're receiving um, you know, the safest, most individualized and most effective option for you. And that can look different for everyone. So this is to break down a little bit further the estrogen therapy versus the progestogen therapy. So again, estrogen therapy, what we're using in practice is 17 beta estradiol. This can come in three different forms. So you can do a patch, you can do a gel, you can do a cream, and they're all considered bioidentical. And then for progestogen therapy, this is, um, there's two different things we can use, micronized progesterone or synthetic progestin. Again, progestin is the synthetic form. Um, we use in practice micronized progesterone just because the data on it is quite positive um, and it is the bioidentical version. The reason I wanted to put MPA in here, which stands for medroxyprogesterone acetate, this is the type of progestin that was used in the Women's Health Initiative study. And that's the study what we'll go through in a second. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that it was a synthetic progestin that they were using. So yeah, basically what we're, prescribing a practice, um, estriol, you know, vaginal cream if we're addressing any sort of vaginal irritation, um, urinary incontinence, UTIs, things like that. Um, and then the patch, the gel, the cream, these are all bioidentical. Um, so we just wanted to highlight that. And, and really one is not better than the other, like, you know, compounded bioidentical, all these things, they're just different. So we just wanna make sure that we're meeting your needs based on what your preferences are, um, yeah, uh, Marnie, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Oh, no, you covered it really well. Um, so if you notice in the middle, it says MHC, menopausal hormone therapy. Yes. And when we're using estrogen therapy in combination with progest progesterone therapy, it's called estrogen progesterone therapy. Um, and anybody with an intact uterus, so who has not had a full hysterectomy or removal of the uterus, must have a progesterone in, con in concurrent um, prescription with estrogen for that uterine protection. So that's where we get into the other types of terminology in terms of estrogen therapy alone, which can only happen if there's no uterus, or estrogen progesterone therapy, which happens in if you do indeed still have your uterus, which is most women. Okay, so this is again kind of what Marnie was showing with the our fluctuation of hormones when we're menstruating. So this basically shows how we have these um, different rise, right? In estrogen, progesterone, um, LH, FSH, those are hormones produced by veins that talk to our ovaries. So you can see that there's this, you know, this flow, this natural flow that happens and natural rise. What happens when we go through um, through postmenopause is that Again, it's kind of like, I like to use the hand gestures like Marnie, but basically estrogen and progesterone is low, right? Uh, when we're in postmenopause, what we're trying to do with hormone therapy is not get you to where you were before. It's just to like bring it up a little bit, right? That's kind of the best way to describe it. We're just trying to get hormones back to a steady level state. Um, and again, you're not going to get a period, right? That's a common question we get asked is like, you know, am I going to get a period if I go on hormones, um, if I'm in postmenopause? And you're not getting a period because you're not getting the fluctuations of these hormones and these drops that trigger a period. So you're just getting enough hormones to be able to act on the receptors and then therefore you get the benefit of that. So this is just to highlight that menopause market is a $600 billion industry. It is massive. And unfortunately, we're the target, right? And this can look very different. It can look like apps, gadgets, supplements, you know, menopause diets. Um, there could be hormone concoctions that people are uh, making. There could be fancy tests, you know, claiming, claiming to cure menopause. And I just wanted to highlight this because it's getting really noisy out there, out in the world. And this is why it's even more important to be aware of what's going on during this time and what is happening hormonally. Um, you want to make your decisions based on facts, based on strategies, and um, hopefully you can make those decisions with a trusted relationship with your healthcare provider. 
So we wanted to go through some of the menopausal hormone therapy history, um, which is quite fascinating. So in 1941, the FDA approved estrogen as a treatment for menopause symptoms. That was the first time it was approved. And the first estrogen pill, which was called Primarin, uh, Premarin, and this is the conjugated equine estrogen that we were talking about, the synthetic, that's when it was introduced in 1942. I know these um, images are quite small, so I can read you some of the campaigns there, but that blue one there, so in 1950s when these marketing campaigns started coming out, so it says, Mabel is unstable. She can't help being impatient. It's that time in her life. To see her through the menopause, there's gentle daytime sedation. So this this is like the marketing that, that was coming out, um, which, yeah, it's it's... Yeah, I see a lot of shaking of heads. I know. <laughs> um, and then the bottom left there is actually they were using like electric shock therapy combined with estrogen uh, for women to, again, sort of sedate women. And so, again, lots of therapies were introduced for these poor women um, that they were marketed to in this way. And so you can see that the messaging around menopause was very negative to begin with. And it was, again, seen as something that women had to be sedated for. Um, and then you can go to the next slide, Bernie. And then in 1996, um, there was the surge of hormone therapy that started to be prescribed. But again, the marketing was around. So there was this um, advertising that came out around feminine forever. And basically what it says there is that now every woman can sleep safely live a full sex life for her entire life. So again, it was focused on sex. Then the marketing propaganda came around men. So it says there, he's suffering from estrogen deficiency. She's the reason why. Um, and then it says there, if she's put on Premarin, she will be pleasant to live with once again. So it's just all around very horrible. Um, but this, so again, hormone therapy was there, but it was really not even about the woman. It was really focused on uh, the other things, right? It's about her being able to have sex and the man in her life being able to like put up with her. So th this is the history. Okay. And then in 1980 to 1990, we started to see observational trials um, that were being done. And they were showing a 40 to 50% reduction in cardiovascular disease in women on hormone therapy. Um, and they also showed a reduced fracture risk. So this is, you know, became one of the main reasons um, to go on hormone therapy. They really thought that it could help with cardiovascular disease in women. And it started to show some really uh, promising results. So trial after trial showed this. So the WHI, this is the big study uh, for, that started in 1991 called the Women's Health Initiative Study. This was one of the largest studies to date that we still have. I mean, the amount of data that we collected from this is, is enormous. So there was 161 uh, postmenopausal women that was enrolled in the study. It was an $126 million trial. Like it was massive. And women were actually followed up for 20 years. So we have a lot of data from the WHI. Basically, it was a series of clinical trials that was put out by the National Institute of Health. And basically what they wanted to do was address the major cause of morbidity and mortality in postmenopausal women. This was like the first large um, scale randomized trial that was you know, had enough people, so it had enough power to be able to test the hypothesis that estrogen replacement can reduce rates of cardiovascular disease. So this was their primary outcome. That's what they were looking at because that's what the observational trials were showing between 1980 and 1990, right? They thought that we could actually use this therapy to reduce cardiovascular disease in postmenopausal women. And then of course there were other parameters that they were looking at that were sort of like secondary outcomes. They were looking at you know, osteoporotic fractures, cancer, dementia, things like that. So this is how the study was uh, broken down. They had um, women who had no uterus. Um, they were just put on the estrogen therapy, as um, Marnie was saying, when you don't have a uterus, you don't um, need that protection from the progesterone. So women who had a use uterus was put on the estrogen progesterone. So you'll see there CEE, that's the conjugated equine estrogen, so the synthetic estrogen. And then the MPA, that's the synthetic progestin, so the progesterone. So the trial was supposed to go for over eight years originally. It was stopped early. So it was stopped about 3.3 years early um, in July 2002, after about a mean follow-up of five years. Um, and 
again, so what they were looking at is, is heart disease. And the expectation was really high for this study. As you can see, they put a lot of time and resources into it because they really thought that the benefit of cardiovascular disease was really going to outweigh the risk of breast cancer. There was some research that was starting to show before we did the WHI that was showing some potential risk of breast cancer, but they thought, you know, it's going to have such a positive benefit for all other things that that small risk in breast cancer um, is going to be negligible. So they actually stopped it early because of the um, increase in um, invasive breast cancer. So these are relative risks. So what they were noticing is that um, in those women who were put on the estrogen and progestin, they were seeing a 26% increase in invasive breast cancer, 29% increase in coronary heart disease, 41% increase in stroke, um, uh, dementia was increased, thromboembolism was increased. As you can see, they were starting to get really scared with these results, and that's why it was stopped early. Um, the, the, and we'll go through like, you know, the pros and cons of this and what we, we think overall. Um, I just want to highlight that these are relative risks and not absolute risk, um, which, which is a big difference. So Marnie, if you can go to the next slide. Some of the concerns with um, this study, there were a couple, but we just highlighted a few here. First, when we talk about relative risk, it's really different to absolute risk. So when we're saying 30% increase in breast cancer, 41% increase in stroke, these are big numbers, right, that, that we get really scared about. So relative risk is when we're um, comparing one group to another, right? That, that's what we're doing. And these can often be misleading and often be over exaggerated about how um, that therapy actually went. When we're talking about absolute risks, it actually gives us context. It's not as scary. It gives us the actual difference in risk between one group and another. So these are numbers are usually a lot, I always say a lot less sexy, <laughs> but they give us a more realistic picture of what is actually likely to benefit someone for a given treatment. Um, and when we're talking about calculating risks in practice, like in practice, we calculate breast cancer. What is your breast cancer risk? What is your cardiovascular risk? These are absolute risks because this is really what's accurate. Um, the other thing about the Women's Health Initiative study is that they were generalizing these findings to all postmenopausal women, right? And they weren't differentiating between um, the ages of these women. So they weren't saying, well, you know, women closer to when they hit menopause may have different outcomes than women like 10 years postmenopause. And there is a huge different bit difference there. The average age for the WHI was about 62, um, and only 12% of the actual participants were under the age of 55, so recently menopausal. And we'll talk about why that is really important. Um, and then they really, there was a failure to put the findings in the context of existing knowledge. So they were taking the position that all prior studies and all the observational data and everything else we saw was simply wrong, that this was now the the, the thing that was coming out and, and, and that this is where the news broke out, right? And I'm sure this stuck, this, and that's the thing, fear sticks, right? When it came all over the news, HRT causes breast cancer, right? It was massive. Doctors to this day, patients to this day, everyone to this day still thinks about that time. Like this is how impactful this uh, propaganda and the study was. And people uh, still think back to that study. It, and, and this is why we have a lot of hesitation now around hormone therapy. And this is why we want to talk about the, um, the risks and the benefits. There was some good, of course, that came out of it. The biggest one is that it gave us this concept of a window of opportunity for women for cardiovascular disease. So what we'll talk about of the benefits is that um, if you initiate hormone therapy within 10 years of your last menstrual period or before 60 years of age, there's actually benefit. So if we initiate it after that point, there's more risk. So that's what that's what's called a window of opportunity. Um, the study was the first time we saw that menopausal hormone therapy reduces fracture risk in addition to increasing bone density in women um, that were selected for osteopenia. We saw that there was actually reduced all-cause mortality with menopausal hormone therapy in women aged 50 to 59. Again, this window of opportunity. And then another thing we learned is that organs and tissues respond differently to estrogen if you haven't had it for a while, right? You can think about if you've had, like, for example, a dry January or dry February, um, and then you have a first glass of wine, you might feel a little tipsy or feel a little drunk, right? It can work in the same way as that. 
um, when we haven't had estrogen for a long period of time, um, our tissues respond differently and we need to be aware of that. So after this study, as you can imagine, use of menopausal hormone therapy decreased approximately 80% um, since that publication in 2002. And unfortunately to this day, it's still um, prescribed so little. So estrogen now is prescribed uh, only three to 4% uh, for peri and postmenopausal women down from 25 to 30% before the WHI. And so um, we really feel that women are not feeling support in this area. And it's because we're not sitting down with them and having an informed conversation about really what the absolute risks are um, and really all the benefits that we can get from it. I firmly believe that we cannot uh, prescribe menopausal hormone therapy in a seven minute appointment, right? It's just, we cannot go over all the informed consent that we need to do. And this is why we are in such a good position to be able to support our patients in this way. So I'll let Margini take it away with some of the benefits. Yes. Um, it's always good to, we, we, we hear so much about the risks associated with, um, hormone therapy, um, that the benefits often don't get the airtime that they deserve. And so just to go back here, and this is where whenever we're talking about any therapy for any concern someone is dealing with, we always want to take, you know, an individualized approach and do an individualized benefit risk assessment assessment and share the decision making pro process with that individual. So when we look at benefits, there's some benefits that are considered first line therapy. So um, horm menopausal hormone therapy can be considered first line therapy. So initiated in before another therapy because we know it's going to work. And so vasomotor symptom relief, that's our hot flashes and, and night sweats. There is no other therapy that will match the efficacy of actually adding back in some estrogen. So estrogen therapy in any form is more effective than placebo in relieving menopausal hot flashes. And it does remain the gold standard for the release of relief of vasomotor symptoms. And so this is obviously in, in appropriate candidates. So There's always going to be a select um, group of people whereby this therapy, so using estrogen and progesterone may not be indicated, but in the absence of contraindications, this is first line therapy. Um, micronized progesterone on its own also reduces the frequency and severity of um, vasomotor symptoms and the expected timeline for benefits. So how, how long it takes for you to notice improvement is typically seen within a month. So it works fast, it works well, and you know, it's very consistent to work across you know, the board. And so when we think about the most bothersome symptoms of that menopause transition, the vasal symptom the vasomotor symptoms, so the hot flashes, the night sweats are, are, are top of mind because it, when, when you're getting those symptoms, it's quite stressful and it influences other aspects of your life, namely your mental health, sleep, and energy. Another benefit that can be considered, you know, first line therapy is for bone health. So women lose up to 20% of their bone density during the, the five to seven years following menopause. So that's pretty significant. And this is really because that there's a, there's a loss in estrogen. So you can take all the calcium you want, but that drop in estrogen is what's going to be responsible for a, a great portion of that bone loss that happens postmenopausally. So hormone therapy is indicated for the prevention of osteoporosis. It reduces fracture risk by about 30%. And these are, and sometimes we have to extrapolate data because we only have data based on, on certain studies and or certain forms of estrogen. So this data is based on uh, studies done with oral estrogen. So although we don't have the data, we can assume that if we, if we achieve the same serum levels with using an oral estrogen or using a transdermal estrogen, we're likely getting same, the same receptor benefit and then thus the same tissue benefit. So we, we do need more studies to, concern, to confirm um, the bone health benefits. And these, these studies are happening now and we'll, we'll likely have a lot more information about uh, benefits with regards to the current form of hormones that we use, the bioequivalent forms, in, in five to 10 years time. Um, so hormone therapy does increase bone mineral, mineral density at all sites with the greatest benefit on vertebral bone density and reducing fracture risk. So again, so for women aged 
less than 60 or within 10 years of menopause, menopausal hormone therapy is likely the most appropriate bone activity therapy in the absence of contra contraindication. So if, unless otherwise contraindicated, it, it, the benefits of initiating bone hormone therapy actually um, are, are quite strong. And the North American Menopause Society is, this is one of their, their, their statements that they make with regards to bone health. And, you know, when we're presented with options for bone health, which there's many different medications out there too, um, hormone placement therapy or menopausal hormone therapy is, a, is quite a strong uh, candidate for the one that would likely be the most beneficial. So bone health continued. So what happens when you stop menopausal hormone therapy? So when you discontinue um, your, your estrogen and progesterone, um, you actually do discontinue, you, do, you lose the protective benefit that you had when the estrogen is there. And then you're basically your bone density, the loss of your bone density will happen. It just happens later. So this leads us to a really big question is like, when should one stop menopausal hormone therapy? The short answer is when the risks outweigh the benefits. And that's something that when in our patient bases, we do an annual benefit risk assessment to make sure that any benefits can, are continuing to outweigh the risks. And if they aren't, then that's a time when we would discuss stopping um, that therapy. Um, and then there's also that element of like, when should you stop anything? There's, there's an element where it, it also is what resonates with you, what makes the most sense in your life and your budget, all of these different things. But the main thing that we're concerned about when we're talking about initiating or discontinuing a therapy is that benefit risk assessment. Another benefit, which, can, which we consider first line therapy, is the benefits of vaginal, um, low dose vaginal estrogen preparations for the resolution of genitourinary syndrome of menopause. So GSM, or the genitourinary syndrome of menopause, is defined as a collection of signs and symptoms that are associated with estrogen deficiency. And so this can involve changes to the labia, the introitus, so the opening of the vagina, the vagina itself, the clitoris, the bladder, and the urethra. So these are very estrogen sensitive tissues. In the absence of estrogen, so when our ovaries are no longer producing estrogen, these tissues change. And it's quite noticeable those changes in, in, in how your body feels. So these symptoms can present themselves as dryness, vaginal dryness, irritation, burning, urinary symptoms. So um, I'll see this often where people feel like they have a urinary tract infection, but there's, there's no bacteria in their urine. They may have um, and more urgency. There also may be more overt urinary tract infections. And then often um, sexual symptoms, so including dryness, uh, irritation, and just pain with sex uh, can occur because the vaginal tissue has changed so much. So low dose vaginal estrogen is, is effective not only at like alleviating, but resolving general, uh, genital urinary syndrome men menopause, which is huge. So then we add back in local estrogen there, it actually restores vaginal blood flow, decreases vaginal pH, and we always want there to be a lower pH in our vagina, a pH of about four, which then improves the microbiome and then reduces the incidence of infections, both vaginal infections and urinary tract infections. And it improves the thickness and elasticity of the vulval vaginal tissues, which in itself is really good for the pelvic floor, but then also, you know, it, it improves sexual, the, the quality of sex, and then reduces pain with intercourse. So again, low dose preparations re result in minimal systemic absorption. So there may be a case where systemic menopausal hormone therapy, so using transdermal estrogen or, or progesterone, in some cases it may be contraindicated, but typically we can still use vaginal, a low dose vaginal estrogen preparation to support um, that tissue and resolve um, GSM. And those, when, they're, when we do run into nuanced more complex um, cases, that's when there is, you know, even greater shared decision making. So shared decision making with perhaps an oncologist or with their family doctor or with another specialist, where we can, you know, firmly decide that this, this therapy, the benefits outweigh like any risks. Another benefit we see with menopausal hormone therapy is sleep. I think this is one of the most uh, important areas of, of anyone's health is, is sleep. And it's, it's 
pretty interesting to, to understand the mechanisms in which both estrogen and progesterone independently work to improve sleep. Um, estrogen is involved in serotonin synthesis and progesterone, one of its metabolites is actually um, a metabolite that binds to our GABA receptors. So serotonin and our inhibitory receptors, it's these GABA receptors are involved in our parasympathetic nervous system and our sleep function. Um, and when we see that huge fluctuation around perimenopause and menopause, we see a, a, a lot of sleep disturbances happen. The literature isn't, isn't as strong as it is when it comes to hot flashes, genital urinary syndrome, and bone health. So we would never use hormone therapy as a treatment for sleep alone. But when we're looking at the whole picture and and we see that there's, there's sleep disturbances alongside there's a motor symptoms and genital urinary um, issues, we could say, you know what, there's also likely going to be a side benefit for your sleep concerns as well. And um, you know, just based on my, my, my practice, it's, it, that's one of the areas you see improve quite quickly is sleep when we, when we do support um, perimenopausal and menopausal women with menopausal hormone therapy. Cognition. So one of the things people will notice in that perimenopausal transition is their memory shifts. They might be having more brain fog. And what we think is happening in the brain is it's really trying to recalibrate to these new hormone levels. Um, good news is these cognitive shifts that happen are believed to be short term, although they can span over several, several years because that menopause transition is several years. And so there was, there's a, another big study that has looked at, um, that at, at menopause specifically, which is called the SWAN study. Um, and one of the things that they saw was that learning memory, memory and processing speed are, are lower in late perimenopause and then improve again. So that late perimenopause is often the toughest part of menopause for people that that year or so before their last menstrual period when their estrogen levels are really fluctuating or really dropping. Um, and we do see that have an impact on cognition. So the research is not robust to show that hormone therapy will help these changes necessarily, but more often than not when people are getting benefits with their sleep um, and when they're not being disturbed with hot flashes during the day, cognition is inherently less burdened body weight. Uh, so there's no evidence that says implementation of hormone therapy is going to cause any additional body weight, nor is there any evidence to say that it's going to to decrease body weight. However, um, what we see is when when sleep is improved, we see that weight management is easier to tackle. Um, so when there's less hot flashes, more sleep and better mood, it makes it easier for people to meet their diet and exercise goals, which are really important to make sure are in place throughout that menopausal transition. Um, another benefit uh, that we, we, we want to focus on is that cardiometabolic health benefit. So again, and this, this is where we talk about that window of opportunity or what we also call the timing hypothesis. You know, in women who are less than 60 um, and less than 10 years since menopause, with no evidence of cardiovascular disease existing, um, we know that there's no increased risk of cardiovascular disease if, if menopausal hormone therapy is initiated within that window of opportunity. And we, what we also are beginning to see is that menopausal hormone therapy may actually reduce the rate of atherosclerosis, so plaque buildup, um, and reduce the rate of cardiovascular disease and all-cause mortality. So again, that window of opportunity is really important. So menopausal hormone therapy, also what we see is it increases that beta cell insulin secretion um, and regulation. So basically what we see is there is less insulin um, sensitivity uh, or insul less insulin resistance, better insulin sensitivity um, when we still have our hormones. So um, hormone therapy significantly reduces the diagnosis of new onset diabetes so by about 30%. Uh, again, it's not a first line therapy. If somebody was pre-diabetic or it had insulin resistance and with the absent and didn't have any, any um, menopausal concerns or, or, or symptoms, we wouldn't say, let's start hormone therapy 
to, to help with your diabetes, no. But it, it has an added benefit if we're, if we're using um, menopausal hormone therapy for the reasons it has first line. So vasomotor symptoms, um, bone health, cardiovascular protection if we, if we implement it within that window of opportunity. But we, like I said, there's a, a side benefit that it likely will help with um, your, your in, insulin and glucose regulation. All right, so we've talked about the benefits and now Diana's gonna take it from here and talk about the known risks associated with menopausal hormone therapy. Alrighty, so we'll start with um, cardiovascular disease. Move to the next. Um, so I, I mentioned this already, but there's this window of opportunity when initiation is most appropriate. Um, and so that's the timing hypothesis and it basically says that age and time since menopause influences the menopausal hormone therapy and cardiovascular disease relationship, such that risks are lower in women who are closer to menopause onset than in those distant from the transition. So that's kind of part of our assessment when we talk about initiation. The route of administration and dose really does matter. We have current data that suggests that transdermal est estrogen, so again, uh, topical on your skin, provides um, less harm and um, provides no harm, but also no benefit for cardiovascular protection. So it kind of has this neutral effect. Um, and what's important to note is that we do not initiate uh, menopausal hormone therapy solely for primary prevention of coronary heart disease, right? We're chaining it for all the other benefits that we want to get for women. Uh, but as Marnie mentioned, you know, within that window of opportunity, you can still get benefits to things like atherosclerosis. Um, and presence of cardiovascular risk factors is not a contraindication to hormone therapy as long as it's optimally man managed. And this is why, again, we come back to it's such, it, it's so individualized. We need to do that intake. We need to, like Marnie and I, you know, go through our assessment. We have all the things that we need to um, look at to make sure that it is a suitable therapy for you. Um, the key differences between like the WHI, the Women's Health Initiative and observational studies is that with the WHI, the average age of hormone therapy initiation was 63 years of age, and the time since menopause was over 12 years. But when we're looking at observational studies, the average age is 52 years, so there's a massive difference there, um, and one to three years since menopause. So that's really important to know between the studies. Okay. So um, as mentioned, we want to be able to, uh, we always recommend and you have to do progesterone therapy if you have a uterus. The reason being is that if we have an opposed or an adequately opposed estrogen in women with a uterus, that can cause uh, endometrial cancer potentially. So Continuous combined menopausal hormone therapy, so that means you're taking the therapy every single day, the um, estrogen, the progesterone, that has a lower risk of endometrial cancer um, versus never using menopausal hormone therapy. So there's some research to, su to suggest that. So we just want to make sure we're taking both of them every single day. Um, vaginal progesterone does not provide endometrial protection. Um, the research is very limited there, so we don't feel comfortable about that providing as much of an effect as oral progesterone. Uh, transdermal progesterone does not provide endometrial protection either, so that's why those are not common uh, prescriptions for progesterone. And then that oral micronized progesterone is what provides endometrial protection based on the studies we've seen. So um, again, it's important to have a practitioner who can safely prescribe in a way that protects your endometrium. Okay, and then the topic of breast cancer, the topic we've all been waiting for. Um, this is a really complex issue. What we want to take home is there's a lot of gray here. It's not a black and white. It's not um, hormone therapy causes cancer, does not cause breast cancer. Like there's a, a lot more research coming out, um, but here's what we know at this time. So we know that transdermal estrogen with oral micronized progesterone has less adverse side effects than doing the oral estrogen and the synthetic progestin. Okay, so that, that's a distinction there. We know there's differences there. Um, estrogens combined with oral or vaginal micronized progesterone do not increase breast cancer risk for up to five years of treatment duration. That's what our current data is showing. So, you know, your 
you know, 50 years old, if you initiated MHT right now, we know that you're quite protected for the first five years. And again, we actually do calculate your breast cancer risk in practice. Marnie will walk through an example. Um, after five years, there is um, a slight increase in risk, and that's based on your own individual calculator risk, the absolute risk that you would be calculating with your provider. Again, it depends on your family history, personal history, all, all those things. You should what we really, we really, we really want to highlight here is that there are both modifiable and non-modifiable breast cancer risks, and we often don't talk about those as well, right? We we don't talk as much about the importance of like, uh, you know, not drinking as much alcohol, the, the, how Im obesity impacts breast cancer, sedentary lifestyle, like these things really do impact breast cancer risk, and we need to be talking about those things as well. Um, with the based on the studies we've seen is that estrogen alone poses no risk to breast cancer, uh, but of course we have no endometrial protection this way uh, if someone has a uterus. So that's why we, we wouldn't prescribe it alone. What we see in, with breast with respect to breast density is that each one percent um, change in mem mammographic density may increase breast cancer risk about one point five to three percent. Um, so th this year kind of you know, puts it into perspective when it comes to um, cases of breast cancer. So for example, for there are about 23 cases of breast cancer diagnosed in the UK general population. We'll have an additional four cases in women who are on, on hormone therapy. There's four um, fewer cases in women on estrogen alone, as mentioned. Uh, we can do that if a woman doesn't have a uterus. We have an additional four cases in women um, on the uh, hormone contraceptive pill. We have an additional five cases in women who drink two or more units of alcohol per day. So you can see that's more than the hormone therapy. There's three additional cases in women who are smokers. And then obesity really takes it to the next level. There's an additional 24 cases in women who are overweight. Um, and then seven fewer cases in women who take at least two and a half hours of moderate exercise a week. So those kind of puts it into perspective. So the take home uh, for breast cancer here is that um, increase in breast cancer may be related to the duration of MHT use. So again, if we're kind of over that five year mark, that's when we really need to evaluate. Um, there's again, no hard like age cutoff, right? For hormone therapy, it's again, when do your risks outweigh the benefits? Um, the risk may be lower when using a micronized progesterone, that's the bioidentical progesterone as opposed to a synthetic one. Um, and again, the risk associated with breast cancer approximately equates to an incidence of, you know, one per thousand women per year. Um, this is similar or lower than the increased risk with sedentary lifestyle, obesity, and alcohol consumption. Risk of breast cancer decreases progressively after treatment is stopped. Um, that's based on current research. Um, and again, you, we calculate your risk. And then we do recommend um, annual mammograms would be something good to consider, especially if you have high density breasts and you just want to make sure that you're staying up to date with screening. Um, and then we just wanted to touch base on the differences between oral and transdermal estrogen, um, because we've mentioned it a few times now. So again, transdermal is when you're doing it on the skin topically. Uh, with oral, we do see increases in blood pressure. We also see increases in triglycerides, um, which is like part of your cholesterol panel. Uh, we can see an increase in blood clots and stroke. Um, we see an increase in inflammatory markers. Um, I guess the one slight benefit is that um, oh, I think it's supposed to say increase HDL. I think that's, uh, mm. I dig there. It increases HDL. <laughs> uh, but so that could be like the one slight benefit. But overall, this is a lot of the reasons why we typically don't go to oral use, um, just because it has these increased side effects. With transdermal, um, like the blood clot, the stroke risk, the inflammatory markers, but that's a neutral effect. And we actually see a decrease um, in cholesterol markers like triglycerides and a decrease in blood pressure. So that's why we go for transdermal. Okay, and so at, what I'm gonna do now is just walk you through an example. A lot of you who work with me have already been through your own individual examples, but this is where we do a balanced risk benefit assessment to in, ensure that we're, we're making a joint decision that, that the continuation or the initiation of menopausal hormone therapy 
is indeed indicated. So for example, we have Mina Paz, who's a 52 year old female. She has hot flashes and night sweats, but it's happening about five, to seven, five out of seven days per week. She's not sleeping well. She's noticing she feels anxious and notices brain fog. Sex has become painful over the past year. And she notices that her vulva and vagina don't look or feel like they it used to. Her last period was about a year ago. She's up to date with PAPs and mammograms, she's, and which have been clear of any pathology. Although her BMI is normal in the normal range, she says she's gained about 10 pounds over the last two years um, because she's noticed that she craves and eats more sugar when she's tired and she hasn't been sleeping well. She wants to know about menopausal hormone therapy and whether or not she's a good candidate. So, you know, what we can discern is, you know, there is some benefits that, that this person, that Mina, Mina Paz would have. Um, it could help with her hot flashes, it could help with the night sweats, it definitely help with the vaginal symptoms. Um, you know, she's, she's recent, she's just entering post-menopause if she doesn't get another period. So we know that we could, we could maintain her bone density a little longer. Um, it would help with sleep, it would likely help with mood. Um, and, you know, there's a possibility that could, it could help with her, her metabolic health as well. Um, so when we, we would talk to this person, we would go through um, their contraindications. So we want to make sure that she herself had no history of breast cancer, no history of stroke, no history of any type of transient ischemic attacks, mini strokes, that she herself had no history of heart attack blood clots, whether they be in the lung or elsewhere. She, she herself had no history of endometrial cancer, didn't have liver disease. Um, she wasn't having uh, like dysfunctional uterine bleeding that was unexplained. This person has not had a period in a year, so we can rule that out. We'd want to rule out that she doesn't have any clotting disorders, um, that her, we would take her blood pressure in practice, right? And then we would do a risk calculator. And so if she had any of those things on that, on that, that high risk column, I would we would not initiate hormone therapy and we would we'd have to, to discuss alternative options first and foremost. Um, and we'd also go through relative contraindications. So I would run a, a lipid panel with this person to make sure that their triglycerides are within normal range. Um, we'd make sure that there's no active gallbladder disease. We'd make sure that um, there is no increased risk of breast cancer. So we'll see on the next slide how we do that. Um, and then there's some other things where we're likely if we're going to be implementing uh, transdermal estrogen, it's less important, but migraine is to use um, oral estrogen is contraindicated if there's history of migraine with aura. So we'd want to just screen for that. Um, we'd want to see where she's at metabolically. Does she have diabetes? Um, because if, if somebody is uh, diabetic or if they ha are in an inflamed state, so let's say they have unmanaged autoimmunity, we, they're already at a higher risk of a stroke. So we don't necessarily want to add hormones into certain environments. Um, so, so far, Mina Paz, this 52 year old woman is checking out. She doesn't have any of the um, high risk or absolute contraindications and she doesn't have any relative contraindications. Um, so what we would move on to is actually doing a breast cancer risk assessment. So we would know that you know, she has no history of breast cancer. She doesn't know whether or not she has the BRCA gene. So we can put that into this calculator. She's 52. She's black. She has no history of breast biopsy. She was 12 when she had her first period. Um, she was 30 at the birth of her first child. And she has zero first degree relatives with breast cancer. So that's her relevant breast cancer history um, or screening. So I would put that into a calculator and I can actually discern what this person's five-year risk of developing breast cancer is. So this is the absolute risk, not a relative risk, an absolute risk. So this patient's absolute risk is 1.2%, which is slightly below average. So we know that she's not at an increased risk of developing breast cancer. And we know that she's up to date with her mammogram screenings so that, you know, as if we can see right here, she's an, a good candidate for HRT or an MHT. I have to get used to saying that one too. And then we would put her information into a cardiovascular risk assessment. So she's 52, she's female, she's black, 
She has a blood pressure of 125 over 84, so it's within the normal range. And I've done her lipid panel and her cholesterol looks good, looks normal. So we put all of those, dat those stats in. She doesn't have diabetes. She's not a smoker. She's not on any hypertensive treatment. She's not on a statin and she's not on aspirin therapy. So this gives her a 10 year risk of cardiovascular disease of 1.3%. And that's an absolute risk, which is quite low. Um, she's actually at that optimal risk category. So we know that this person is not at an increased risk of heart attack or stroke. Again, good candidate for um, menopausal hormone therapy. So when we want to kind of put that all together, we're going to say, okay, great, you meet the criteria. And we've had that discussion around the benefits and the risks associated with it. And we can safely prescribe and monitor therapy. Um, and we always want to talk about the side effects and things to watch out for so that there's open communication and that we can make adjustments if and when they are needed. And so this is where it's a good segue into naturopathic menopausal support, because when we're looking at a person transitioning into menopause, we don't just want to give them a prescription. We want to make sure we're setting the foundation for optimal health so that they're their weight is managed, that their blood pressure is managed, that their stress is managed, that they're eating healthy, that they're exercising. So I'm going to let uh, Diana take it from here just around how it's not just about a prescription, it's really about treating the whole person in a way that resonates with them and that's well-rounded. Yeah, so yeah, what I wanted to mention here is that um, as naturopathic doctors, we're really, again, you have a naturopathic doctor who focuses in this area. We're really good at sitting down with our patients one-on-one. -on -one. Um, we have that diversification of knowledge that I think is really powerful. So we can bring that evidence-informed care and we can have a really thorough intake and an individualized plan. I said this before in the presentation, but I think I'll reiterate it again that I don't think uh, MHT can be prescribed safely in a seven-minute visit with your GP. There's just so much that needs to we need to go through. You saw through this presentation, we go through all of this uh, with our patients within the hour, hour and a half that we have together and to calculate the risk and, and all the things. So we want you to also form that trust relationship with your provider so you feel uh, taken care of and you feel like you've been uh, safely prescribed something. But as Marnie mentioned, um, you know, menopause hormone therapy can really just be like the icing on the cake uh, for a lot of women. We're still looking at everything else. So hormone therapy is one tool of a really complex strategy, right? So we're looking at herbs and nutrition. We're looking at stress management, exercise, diet. We're looking at the whole picture because that's what we do best. That's really what's in our arsenal. We treat the whole person. Um, but MHT can be that thing that really makes you go from feeling, you know, a five out of 10 to nine out of 10, right? And, and that's the discussion that we really have in practice. So um, yeah, that's the conclusion. It's, it's not just a prescription where we're kind of really looking at the whole picture. All right. So we're going to open up the floor to any questions. Um, so you feel free to, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen. Feel free to open, to put anything in the chat or raise your hand and, um, yeah, give us any feedback or, I'm going to stop recording too. So let me just see here. Um, so